Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. I am Michael Waldman. I am the president of the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU School of Law, and we are really delighted to have you join us for this extraordinarily important and very timely uh, conversation. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, the Brennan Center is a nonpartisan law and policy institute affiliated with NYU. We work to strengthen, to renew, and reform the systems of democracy and justice in the United States so that they work for all. Uh, we, we hold up the institutions of self-government uh, in light of what we hope are the strong values the country hopes to aspire to, uh, and we look for ways to make change, uh, and we want to hold them up to those values of democracy and equality and justice for all. Now, as many of you know and can imagine, this year in 2020, we are particularly focused in much of our work on the election, on making sure that we can have an election in a time of pandemic uh, that is free and fair and secure and safe. Um, we all know there are deep challenges. We know that on election day, uh, that we very possibly won't know the results uh, for several days, uh, and that Americans can vote with confidence and should know that it will take longer to count, and that's not a sign of something wrong, but sign that actually officials are doing the right thing by making sure that every vote is counted. Uh, we work on those issues day and night. And uh, in the context of the election, I do want to point out uh, that we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We are nonpartisan. We don't participate in elections or oppose or endorse candidates. Um, and you will not hear any of that here today in this conversation. Um, it, it, this is a moment in our country, not only, of course, of pandemic, not only of economic recession, but of an extraordinary and long overdue reckoning with the history, centuries long, of systemic racism and racial injustice in our country. Uh, this didn't start last week. It didn't start with the murder of George Floyd or Breonna Taylor. It goes back, of course, centuries. And in so many ways, our whole country is grappling with what that means and what we can do about it. Yesterday, as part of that effort, uh, the Brennan Center for Justice released a significant new report, six years in the making, that examines the staggering lifetime consequences of involvement in the criminal justice system, uh, a look at the economic, personal, and social cost of being caught up in its gears. Uh, among other things, uh, this report includes a first-of-its-kind empirical analysis showing that people who've spent time in prison, see their subsequent annual earnings reduced by an average of 52%. That's a lifetime loss of nearly $500,000. Even a misdemeanor has deep and lasting consequences. Uh, after a conviction, as the report shows, people see their annual earnings reduced by an average of 16%. Um, and most striking in some ways at this moment, a black person with no criminal conviction will earn less than a white person with a criminal conviction when they come from the same class background. Uh, this shines a light on some of the most disturbing consequences of the system of mass incarceration we have built up in this country, uh, which, produces, uh, which produces inequality and injustice without being necessary we believe, for public safety. The authors of the report will share more of their most important takeaways in a moment. I do want to note that the uh, lead author of the report, Dr. Terry Ann Craigie, who is a faculty member at Connecticut College and is the economics fellow at the Brennan Center's Justice Program, she is unable to be with us today. Uh, and we are so grateful to her for the rigor and passion she has brought to this, uh, to this important and, and uh, very timely report. I will uh, also thank our colleagues in producing this event. We've partnered first with Robin Hood, uh, who generously supported the research that went into this report, with NYU's John Bradamus Center, uh, which advocates for civil debate on politics and public policy, and with NYU Votes, which strives to give eligible NYU students the information they need 
to be able to cast their ballot. And for any NYU students who, who are watching, who want that information, it's nyu.edu slash nyu.edu slash nyu hyphen votes. That, that'll clear it up uh, for all the resources you need uh, to, uh, to be part of our democracy this year. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists and turn it over to them. Uh, first off, Wes Moore is Chief Operating Officer of Robin Hood. He is the New York Times best-selling author of books, including Five Days, The Fiery Reckoning of an American City, The Work, My Search for a Life That Matters, and the other Wes Moore. Welcome to this conversation, Wes. It's great to be with you, Mike. Great to be with all of you. Thank you. Um, and joining Wes Moore will be my colleague, Lauren Brooke L.B. Eisen. Um, L.B. is the director of the Justice Program at the Brennan Center and is the author of the book Inside Private Prisons, An American Dilemma in the Age of Mass Incarceration. Welcome, L.B. Thank you, and thank you to all the panelists. I'm thrilled to be here today and to join all of you in today's important conversation. Um, and she and Wes will be joined by Ames Grower. He is the John New Senior Counsel uh, at the Brennan Center's Criminal Justice Program and is a uh, co-author of this report. Welcome, Ames. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's a privilege to be here. And finally, uh, leading this conversation, moderating it, uh, and uh, uh, we're thrilled to have back in this in the, in our midst our longtime colleague Nicole Austin Hillary. Uh, Nicole is the executive director for, for U.S. programs of Human Rights Watch, uh, and she's part of our family because she was the first director and for eight years director and general counsel of our Washington D.C. office. Nicole, uh, thank you for being part of this and for helping us out. Michael, thank you so much for inviting me to come back. I always will feel as though I'm a member of the Brennan Center family. So it's an honor to be here for what I know is going to be a very critical and important conversation today. I'm gonna to start off our conversation by just letting all of our participants know that uh, we're going to have a robust uh, interactive conversation with the panelists. But at the end, we're going to open this up because we wanna hear from you. We wanna get questions from you. So you are able to put those questions in the Q&A box and we will take as many of them as we can get to uh, near the end of the program. We're gonna try and make sure we have plenty of time for your questions. Uh, so just keep them coming and we will get to them um, after our conversation. So to get started, uh, Wes, uh, I'd like to turn to you. Um, I think it's always important in conversations like this to start from a very personal perspective. Uh, and I know that these issues, uh, the heart of this report, uh, deals with issues that are very personal to you. Um, I'm familiar with a story that you've told before about uh, an experience you had during your childhood uh, where you had an encounter with police. I think it would be really, um, really important for this conversation, Wes, if you would be willing to share that with our audience and talk to us about how that impacted you and really how that ties you to this work that's at the heart of the report. Absolutely. And, and, and first, I just want to once again, just say what an honor uh, it is to be not just with all of you today, but honestly, what an honor it is for, for, for Robin Hood to be a, a partner in this work. Uh, you know, we, we had the privilege uh, of, of being a part of this work. And we are excited because we know that as an organization, you know, we are going to lean into all of these reports recommendations. Uh, and you cannot talk about the issue of and the challenge that we have within our criminal justice system, without also looking at the impact of race and poverty and the interconnectivity of all of those things. Because you know, when, when I had my first, my first real interaction with law enforcement, uh, it was when I was 11 years old. You know, the first time that I felt handcuffs on my wrist was when I was 11. And it was actually in the Bronx. It was up in New York. And it was one of these things where Every single reminder that we needed, that we lived in a community that was treated differently, we got. Where it was everything from the air that people are breathing and the water they are drinking and the schools they are attending and the neighborhoods that we called home and yes, how we were policed. And so the, the fact is, is that not only is this a very personal issue for me, the fact that we 
still have so much to address, so much to uncover when we talk about the issues of criminal justice and how it impacts lives, how it impacts young lives, and how it is incredibly predictable about the way that it impacts lives. And that's one of the things I think this report is going to be so important to the conversation. But we also see how these things that are happening and the challenges that we have within communities of being able to unpackage it, it actually becomes unable to unpackage if you do not understand the complete interconnectivity of race, poverty, and ineffectual and, and unequal criminal justice systems. And again, it was something that I saw at a, at a, at a very young age. Uh, and it's something that unfortunately we just continue to see, hence why this work becomes that much more important. Wes, thank you so much for sharing that and for really laying the foundation um, for how we need to frame this conversation. You're right, those issues are all inextricably linked. Um, let me turn to Lauren Brook. And I want our audience members to forgive me. Uh, I think you heard Michael in his introduction of Lauren Brooke say that we affectionately call her LB. It is far too long for me to say Lauren Brooke. And I feel like I will not be a, her friend if I call her anything other than LB. So for the purposes of this conversation today, I'm going to call you LB if that's okay. Um, so LB, I want to turn to you. Um, you're the head of the justice program at the Brennan Center. And I know just from my time at the Brennan Center, this report and this research was a long time coming. It's work that you all have been focused on for quite some time. Um, tell us a bit more about the conception of this report. Um, what was the initial genesis for it? And, and how has that changed uh, in terms of the time that's gone by and where we are at this moment in the country? How has that impacted where the report um, ended up and what went into the report? Thank you, Nicole, and just thank you to all of my fellow panelists. And it is so good to see you again, Nicole Westmore. Thank you for joining us today. Um, congratulations, AIM, on this report's launch. And Nicole, you ask a really great question. As you know, our justice program at the Brennan Center focuses on reducing our reliance on incarceration. And this report that was just released yesterday is part of a body of work that demonstrates some of the harsh societal consequences of mass incarceration and the deep racial and economic inequities it perpetuates. Originally, when this report was first conceived, it focused on the effect of prison on the economy as a whole. Basically, if you could add up the lost earnings due to imprisonment, what would that look like in terms of lost GDP? But we soon realized that the data allowed us to tell a very different story, and that is a story of inequality and poverty. We didn't want to tell another story about those impacted by mass incarceration in the abstract. We wanted to move away from that and focus on individual experience, showing how this issue is deeply personal for so many people. So the report ultimately focused on how not only imprisonment, but mere contact, minor contact with the criminal justice system impacts future economic prospects, specifically the ability to earn a living wage over a lifetime and how this contributes to systemic issues of economic inequality. And we haven't yet even talked about the sheer size of America's justice involved population. The US currently incarcerates 2.2 million people, disproportionately Latino and black Americans. We have 4.5 million people in the United States on probation or parole. 7.7 .7 million people living in the U.S. have spent some time in prison. And as this report illustrates, a new finding from the report we just released yesterday is that about 45 million people have been convicted of a misdemeanor. That's about 14% of the entire U.S. population. This level of criminal justice involvement has massive societal consequences. We all know it drives and reinforces deep-seated racial inequity, disproportionately punishes Black and Latino Americans, and incarceration itself is uniquely devastating. It ruins people's lives. It breaks up families. In fact, 2.7 million children have a parent in jail or prison. That's about 1 in 28 American children with an incarcerated parent. As a nation, we need to confront the damaging lifetime effects of criminal justice involvement for our communities. If we are serious about addressing intergenerational poverty, we have to overhaul our criminal legal system. 
LB, thank you for that. Those are some stark statistics. Ames, let me turn to you next. Um, you know, we we all know from not only the Brennan Center's research, but from research done by other think tanks, um, that there are links, um, very specific links between economics and one's interaction with the criminal justice system, particularly uh, one's time spent uh, in the carceral system. Can you tell us why the Brennan Center's report uh, adds value to this conversation? Uh, what are some of the nuances um, that we think are going to help elevate this conversation, frankly, to, to a new level uh, and to a level that's going to help us to expand our thinking uh, around how we approach reform uh, in this area? Nicole, thank you. First of all, it's just it's so good to see you again. I want to lead with that and I want to echo what everyone else has said and extending a heartfelt thank you to everyone at the Brennan Center and Robin Hood. It's, it's a real pleasure and an honor to be able to do this work at such a critical time. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to talk to that. So uh, as you said, there's, there's been significant research on the effects of prison on inequality and in earnings. Uh, and uh, some, of the, some great research done by uh, Bruce Western, for example, who actually um, reviewed a draft of this report. Um, but what we add to that literature is we try to take a look at not just what happens in prison, but what happens elsewhere in the criminal justice system. So how many people have, for example, been convicted of a misdemeanor? And what are the impacts of that on people's uh, short and long-term economic outcomes? Um, what we found was really striking, uh, and, and this is sort of a growing area of research. So we're really hoping that this report sparks um, greater interest in not just you know the very highest levels of involvement in the justice system, but how every level affects poverty and uh, well-being over the short and long term. So, Ames, I'm going to stick with you uh, because I want to dig into this a little bit more. Um, you know, what were some of the key results that you found in doing this research? Um, were there any things that surprised you? Uh, were there any things that confirmed uh, some theories uh, that you'd already had uh, about what you believe were happening in the system. Um, it, it, I think it's going to be really helpful for our audience um, to just get some more specifics on the findings. Absolutely. Happy to. Uh, so the prime finding of this report can be summed up like this. There are more people who are more severely impacted by the criminal justice system than we previously thought. Um, we know that 70 million people, uh, more than that, really, have a criminal record of some kind. What we show in this report and what really struck me first is that 45 million have a misdemeanor conviction. Um, that's a rough estimate because the data on the criminal justice system is, is really just not where it needs to be to, to um, understand and tackle the problems inherent in it. Um, but that's a shocking number. I mean, it suggests that uh, it, at least, you know, even, even if our estimate is high, it suggests that uh, more than a tenth of Americans and like LB said, around 14% probably have a, a relatively serious interaction with the justice system that marks them for life. Um, that was number one. Number two, what really surprised me is um, uh, I, I, was for, I was a prosecutor for four years. Um, I, I know how the criminal justice system works. Uh, when we first sought out to estimate the effect of um, how a misdemeanor conviction affects earnings and how it differentiates from how, how a felony conviction affects earnings, I thought what we'd see is, is, is sort of what, what you might expect that um, prison has a really serious effect on earnings. Uh, conviction has a, a marginal effect on earnings. And misdemeanor conviction has a relatively small effect on earnings. Uh, in fact, what we found is, is rather different. Uh, we found that prison does have a profound and devastating impact on earnings. Michael highlighted it at the top of the, of the event. Uh, nearly 52% reduction in annual earnings. But what's really shocking is that the effects of felony and misdemeanor conviction aren't really that different in the grand scheme of things. Um, it, when, when I saw these findings, and we really came to this with no preconceptions about what these results might hold, uh, we, were, we were guided by the data and what the data showed us. Um, it, it started me thinking that we really need to talk more about um, reducing the number of people who have an interaction with the justice system in any way, um, not just reducing how many people go to prison, not just how many people have a felony conviction, but how many people are even arrested and face a relatively minor sanction. Um, and, and the last bit that, that kind of surprised me, but actually it shouldn't have, um, is we were able to estimate how many people have been to prison in the U.S. And it's 7.7 it's, it's, uh, million. Uh, and we were able to produce a, a breakdown of that group by race. Um, and according to our analysis, there are more black men and women in this country who have been to prison than white men and women. And that's, that's shocking considering that white men and women by far make up the majority of this country. Um, and 
However, it probably shouldn't have shocked me if you look at the data on any given year on how many people are in prison. Um, and e even in 2018, the last year with data available, and it, it's another story why we're still waiting on 2019 data. Um, it, it, people of color still outnumber white people by a huge margin. Um, a colleague of mine, uh, Jay Cullen, who contributed this report, actually produced an analysis a couple of years ago showing that you know, while racial disparities in prison are falling, it would take decades, even close to a century, to eliminate racial disparities in prison. I think we, we sort of, we underscore that and we emphasize um, how stark and discriminatory our justice system has become. Ames, thank you um, for going through all of that detail. Um, it's disturbing. Um, and, you know, Wes, I want to turn back to you. It is disturbing. Um, and I, I want to talk about the, the foundation um, that you oversee, the Robin Hood Foundation. Mm -hmm. You focus on issues of poverty. But this report, as we've just heard from LB and Ames, is really focusing on the criminal justice system. And you started to talk about this in some of your opening remarks uh, about the fact that it, these issues, there's a connective tissue between these issues. Can you talk about that a little bit more? How are these two areas of concern really connected here? Um, and how is the work and the findings of this report going to show up in the work that your organization does around poverty and, and why should it? You know, I think one of the things that the report does a great job of doing is showing that there, there isn't just this level of this, this devious connectivity it's almost this idea that they are almost they were born from the same place, right? There's a there's a predictability towards it, and you know, and I think you know, Ames brought up the point when we're looking at how this report it, it provides the first ever estimate of of living Americans that have been convicted of a misdemeanor, right? Misdemeanor, hovering it around at, at least forty five million. That's about fourteen percent of the U.S. population. Uh, more than seven million people who are living in the U.S. have spent time in prison. And upon release, a person's subsequent earnings are reduced by an average of, you know, over 51%. And so you look at almost this, this, there's a level of intentionality that I think we have to understand when it comes to how that is made up. And particularly when you consider the fact that, you know, uh, as of last year, you know, black and Latinx males accounted for 58% of the inmate population. White males accounted for 29% of the population and the inverse of the actual proportional representation of the population is actually the truth. And so and, and it, it actually brings me back to one of the first things, one of, one of my first experiences as a CEO of Robin, it was about four years ago, where one of the first visits I did, one of the first community partner visits I did was to go spend time over in Rikers Island. And spend time in Rikers Island because, you know, we really wanted to see the depth of the work that Robin Hood is doing. And Robin Hood uh, has historically and continues to do significant work in the space of justice reform, uh, also in the space from everything from how are we thinking about uh, alternatives to incarceration to reentry services. And we were there because we invest in, 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 in low income at risk use and, and provide education, job training, social services, all the other profits and organizations like uh, the Center for Employment Opportunities or, or, the, or the Fortune Society. And so we were there to see the work of these organizations and other, you know, also other organizations we support like the Legal Aid Society and Good Call. And I remember that being one of my first visits where I got a chance to feel so emboldened to see such good work taking in, taking place, such life-saving work taking place about how are we thinking about HCI and how are we thinking about reentry services and how are we making sure that you know people that can actually you know and working and advocating on on laws and policies that people can actually use things like Pell grants in prison and making sure that we're providing pathways for people who who happen to be incarcerated as they come back home. But I also remember feeling that in many ways the individual patchwork, while important, still is never going to be enough if we're not able to actually get at the centering challenge that we continue to face. And that centering challenge, as was highlighted before, is this fundamental challenge that we have this, this, this deep interconnectivity of how all of these systems are then placing that are making poverty so unbelievably generational, so unbelievably dire, and so unbelievably predictable. 
And so the ability to understand how all these things aren't just tied, but how many ways they are birthed from the same place, and that's allow their growth to be completely aligned, is something that not just the report, what makes the, re the report really important, that the work and the funding of, organ of Robinhood and the organizations like Robinhood incredibly important, but why all of those things have to do a larger level of unpackaging to be able to understand the depth of where we are and the level of connected involvement that we've got to do in order to, to make real, real adjustments and changes of what we're talking about here. Wes, I like that, uh, that terminology, centering challenge. Uh, I think we're gonna come back to that um, as we continue this conversation. Um, and LB, uh, let me use that to open up my next question to you. Um, you've been doing this work for quite some time. I'd like for you to talk about how at other points in your work, you've seen the interconnectivity between poverty and, and mass incarceration. Uh, we know as we talk about reform and we talk about systemic injustice and systemic racism, that it's not just about one myopic area where these things show up. Where else are you seeing this show up in the point of your work? Yes, and um, I also wanted to make sure that we acknowledge one more time our co-author, Terri Ann Craigie, who unfortunately can't be here today. Um, we owe so much of the thinking, research, um, passion, and methodology of this report and its rigor, as Michael Waldman said, to Terri Ann. I know um, she, she unfortunately couldn't be here with us, but I just wanted to acknowledge her tremendous um, research and work on this report. And, you know, Nicole, to your question, I want to pick up what what Wes Moore mentioned, you know, Wes spoke about intentionality. And we talk about that a lot when we focus on the criminal justice system, how punitive the criminal justice system is, how um, these racial disparities are so rampant in our criminal justice system. And I think for many years, many of us, um, many policymakers have been trying to roll back some of the harsh draconian practices of the past and we've used words like, well, these were unintentional consequences or this federal funding meant well, but you know, it had these unintended consequences. And I'm glad that Wes mentioned that because so much of the federal funding, so much of the economic inequality was intentional at various points in time. And it's really important that we reckon with that and reckon with how much of our justice system, you know, didn't just emerge and didn't just end up with you know, 2.2 million people behind bars and how it was this intentional buildup to mass incarceration and, and sort of in, in the sense of the connection to poverty and mass incarceration and how they're intertwined. You know, the Brennan Center for more than a decade now has studied criminal justice debt and how this debt can undermine re-entry prospects, how these fees and fines can pave the way back to prison or jail and even result in more costs to the public. Um, over this last decade, we've seen that criminal fees and fines have become key sources for, of revenue for funding courts, for other justice agencies, and for other purposes altogether. And our Brennan Center research has found that fees and fines as sources of court and other program funding really don't make any sense because they're so costly. And our original research has documented some of these costs, which include the high cost of jailing people simply because they're too poor to pay these fees and fines, a practice that not only produces significant harms, but it also raises serious, serious concerns about constitutional practices and unnecessary incarceration. For those who can't afford to pay the money they owe, they become debtors whose bill collectors are judges and the police. We know that after prison, so many formerly incarcerated individuals can't vote, can't find jobs. They can't receive public benefits like subsidized housing, all of which would improve their ability to not only reintegrate into their communities, but to earn a living for themselves, for their families. And there are thousands more of these collateral consequences. Most people getting out of prison are already starting out with one hand tied behind their back. And our team's latest findings demonstrate that ending mass incarceration is an economic imperative as much as a moral one. It's a vital step toward restoring prosperity to underserved communities across the country. 
and toward closing the racial wealth gap. I want to go back to you because you know this has been a, a very interesting conversation, um, but it's been one that um, where we've really talked about statistics uh, and we've talked about findings and research, which is at the heart of the report. But I know what brings research and data to life for so many people is being able to tie it and link it to real life stories. Um, in your book, Five Days, uh, I know that you write about Freddie Gray. Um, the individual uh, whom we, we all know, we are familiar with his story. Um, he died in police custody in Baltimore, Maryland. And you talk about the fact that Freddie came from a, an impoverished background. Um, and, and it's interesting because so many people don't focus on the fact that there are dozens and dozens and dozens of communities throughout this country where people are living with poverty. Um, we, we sometimes think of the United States as a place of equality, or at least conceptually, um, that's what we're supposed to think. But, but you know, and I know, that that's not necessarily the reality. Can you talk to us about some of those real life stories and tell us what is it that has to be done in order to make economic equality something that's real and not just something theoretical that we talk about in the United States, it's uh it's interesting because you know when people say that the United States is is, is the land of opportunity, uh, that's true. It's the land of selected opportunity and selective opportunity because it is not the equal opportunity place that oftentimes people want to think that it is. Um, you know, and I think about the case of, of Freddie Gray as actually a perfect example and actually a perfect example of what we're talking about today, Nicole, because the, the reality is that first interaction that Freddie Gray had with law enforcement uh, that, that day, the, the time that he was killed in police custody, that's actually a perfect example of what we're talking about, about those discrepancies. Because if you look at what triggered the initial interaction that Freddie Gray had with those police officers that day, his crime was that he made eye contact with the police and ran. That was his legitimate crime. And I say that, and I don't say this lightly, but I say that because that was only considered a crime and it only triggered probable cause in certain neighborhoods. Making eye contact and running from police only triggers probable cause in high crime, high poverty neighborhoods. Had he done that a mile down the road in a wealthier neighborhood, him making eye contact police and running would not have been a crime. Him making eye contact police and running would have been him going for a jog. But he makes eye contact and he runs and they run after him. And an hour after he is arrested, he's in a coma. And it's found out when he eventually makes it to the University of Maryland Medical Center that uh, he's in a coma because he has three broken vertebrae and a crushed larynx and a crushed voice box. And the thing that really, and, and this triggered weeks of protests that took place in, in Baltimore where people were demanding accountability and wondering, how does a person make eye contact with police and an hour later they're in a the coma? But it also really did underscore some of the other elements of what it is that we're talking about when we, when we, when we mention the high levels of inequality and how it ends up showing itself in so many different ways. Because some of the other things we learned about Freddie Gray in his life was that this was also a, 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 a young man who was born underweight and premature. He was born into deep poverty. His mother lived in deep poverty her entire life. She battled addiction for much of her life and Freddie Gray was exposed to, was, had, had heroin exposures before he was even born into the world. When they moved out of the, when he finally gained enough weight, him and his twin sister, that they could leave the hospital, they moved into a housing project in West Baltimore. And in 2009, that home and 480 other homes were cited in a civil lawsuit because of the endemic levels of lead inside of that home. So here was a young man who was born premature, underweight, born into deep poverty, born exposed to heroin, and lead poisoned. And by that time in Freddie's life, he's two years old. So when people make this argument about people in poverty should just work harder, or that 
poverty is somehow a choice. My argument always back is, you know what, it is a choice, but it's not a choice of the people who are inflicted by this deep pain and this deep weight of poverty. It's the choice of our society to allow that much pain in our neighbors. And so you see how Freddie Gray's, the impoverished nature, the impoverished areas in which he found himself growing up in and living in and existing in, uh, that this interaction with police and this interaction with law enforcement, uh, which again, was only a crime in his neighborhood, was something that was a demonstration that that was actually the last system to fail Freddie Gray, to fail Freddie Gray. And you see how all of these things just remain completely interconnected when it comes to helping to define the destiny of all of our neighbors around us. Thank you for helping us to put a real person um, and real life experiences, Wes, to these concepts. It, it really helps to bring home an understanding of them. Um, I want to open us up to questions, but before I do, I can't uh, let us do that without quickly mentioning, and, and, and LB, I'll ask you um, to kind of tie this together for us, and then we'll open it up to our, to our audience members. Uh, but we are in a pandemic right now. There has been lots of focus on COVID and how it has impacted people in our prison systems in the United States. You all have done work on it. We've issued reports on it in the last few months at, at Human Rights Watch. Um, it's critical to look at how COVID is impacting people who are in those confined spaces, who do not have the same freedoms of choice, uh, and not self-quarantine. Um, they're uniquely impacted. What are some of the implications from this report, LB, that we should be thinking about um, as we look at how our carceral systems in the United States uh, are dealing with, with COVID um, and, and, and what their experiences are, both from a justice and an economic uh, perspective. Absolutely, Nicole. And incarcerated people, um, those in our jails and our prisons and our immigrant detention centers have been severely impacted by the pandemic. As we know, social distancing in correctional facilities is generally difficult, if not impossible. Um, making matters worse, many of our prisoners are elderly with a history of poor health care. In fact, 40% of those held behind bars suffer from at least one chronic health condition like asthma or diabetes, putting them more at risk of not only getting sick, but of dying of COVID-19. In fact, a recent study found that people behind bars are infected by um, COVID-19 at a rate more than five times higher than the nation's overall rate. We have seen that there's been some, some decarceration and mostly that's been because of some reductions in jail populations. We know that some large county jails have reduced their populations between March and May, but we're starting to see an uptick again. And you know, we know that jurisdictions have started to reverse that reduction. So the reason why you know, this report um, speaks to what's happening right now with this economic downturn um, with so many people who are going to be leaving our jails and our prisons with little economic prospects um, is, is really significant. And today's worsening economic conditions may hit justice-involved people the hardest. And this is going to compound the disadvantages that we already identify in the report. As we mentioned in the report, studies show that as many as 45% of formerly imprisoned people are unemployed during that first year following their release. And given today's economic downturn, we don't expect to see these numbers improve in the short term. So th this is incredibly relevant. And another way that the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic is reinforcing existing racial inequalities in health outcomes and access to care. And we hope that this report will provide some role in bringing about a true rethinking of who we can keep away, not only from our jails and from our prisons, but from our vast criminal justice infrastructure, even after today's moment has passed. Thank you for tying that all together for us, LB. Let's turn to some of the questions that have been generating. Um, and this, this conversation has been so rich. 
Uh, so that it's been generating a lot of questions and we wanna get to as many of them as possible. Let's start with this one. Um, one of the questions uh, is how do racial disparities in policing contribute to or manifest in the economic inequalities that are described in this paper? Uh, so Ames, I'm going to turn to you um, to, to start addressing that question. Yeah, happy to. Um, that's a great question. So the, the racial disparities in prison we document don't just, you know, happen. Uh, they, they don't, that, that's not just the way it is. Um, they, they come from somewhere and they, I, we don't study this specifically in this report, but I think we know from other Brennan Center research and other research in the field that um, communities of color are policed at uh, disproportionate rates for offenses that uh, if you look like me, you might not be arrested for, you might not be prosecuted for, you might, you might never be in prison for. Um, so I think disparities in policing faced by communities of color um, funnel people toward the system that we're describing so that um, th this is all really tied together. Like w when, when you see people protesting disparities in policing and the criminal justice system, um, I, they're not just talking about interactions with police, but that obviously is a huge part of it. Um, they're talking about everything that flows out of it and what they know uh, and what we can what we can show you know, numerically what that does to um, their communities and what that does to uh, you know someone's chances to earn a living wage, to pass wealth on to the next generation, um, and uh, and build a stable home for themselves. Great, thank you so much, Ames. LB, I'm going to ask you the next question, um, which is how do penalties such as fees and fines and cash bail contribute to the economic consequences? of involvement with the criminal justice system. And you started to touch on this earlier in some of your, in some of your comments. So I think this is a great um, follow-up to some of what you were already offering to us. Absolutely. And you know, I'm glad that somebody asked this question in the audience because you know, this report is really about how the justice system perpetuates and increases in economic inequality in this country and what those disparate, disparate outcomes are with those inequalities. And we know um, that for fines and fees, for example, they are often imposed on the most marginalized communities in our country. Um, we saw that after Ferguson, after the Justice Department's investigation of Ferguson. And we see that in the research that we do. Um, there was recently um, research done by, um, in New York around um, disparate impacts in traffic stops in upstate New York. And the reason why this is related to you know, the economics of mass incarceration is because Black Americans, Latino Americans are more likely to be stopped by the police for new traffic infractions, for taillight infractions. They are more likely to owe fees and fines. And we know about you know, the vast consequences related to mass incarceration. If one can't pay off their fees and fines, and we saw this, we just released a report last November um, the steep cost of criminal justice fees and fines, where we found that um, people in states um, in New Mexico and states that we studied in Florida were being jailed for non-payment of their fees and fines. And we know that a lot of those people were low-income individuals who literally could not afford to pay off that debt. And when those people are jailed, they are not actually paying that money. Right, the, the government is not getting any money from that. The government is just losing um, money because they are paying for that person's incarceration. And then those people who are jailed for non-payment, they are separated from their families, their communities, they are separated from their jobs. They might not be able to take their children to school that day. Um, and we know that jail and prison cause trauma. Um, these are places where um, people are often experiencing um, assaults and pretty horrific conditions of confinement that, that not only cause, you know, we know that jail and prison don't only cause economic consequences, but we know that there's life trauma associated with time spent in these places. And these are really important things to consider um, because, you know, someone owing $50 may not seem like a lot, but it is and it can have lifetime consequences um, because of those fees and fines that our criminal justice system requires um, so many people to pay. Thank you, LB. And thank you for expanding on that because I know, as I said, you did touch on that earlier, but I, I thought it was worth going back to. Um, Wes, I'm gonna ask you the next question, but LB and Ames, um, I, I, I'd like you both to, uh, to expand on it a little bit too. But Wes, given the work that you do focused on poverty, this next question is asking, what are the potential solutions to the prison-driven income gap? 
Are there policies that have made a dent in it? So I think it's great to start with you, but given the research that Ames and LV have done with respect to this report, I'm hoping they can add something uh, to that as well. Yeah, so it, it's, it, it, it's a great question um, because we see how these gaps start existing from such an early stage of involvement and then they just continue to spread themselves and show themselves out. Uh, you know, the, the first thing that we have to be able to do is, you know, first, again, the reduction of people who have to be involved within the system is absolutely imperative. And we cannot lose sight of that when we're looking at any of these recommendations, uh, you know, and, and our ability to work collectively to do things like reducing penalties, reclassifying felonies, and misdemeanors, working to decriminalize other offenses, reform the parole system. You know, all of these things must be done in concert of making sure that we can reduce the amount of people that ever have to have any form of, or any form of touch point within that larger criminal justice system. The second point is when we're looking at the challenges that exist for people once they are incarcerated, uh, you know, how, how we're thinking about a, a, a workforce, pay, pay barriers, pay restrictions on what that happens and how that also decreases people's ability to be able to form and create any form of sustainable support while they're inside and an inability to people, for people to be able to get training and or degrees once they're inside also then have long-term implications as people then leave prisons as well. And so one of the, one of the things I found really and was really taken by the, with, with this report was that ability to be able to tie up and connect, not just an inability for people to be have any forms of partnership or any forms of ties with the system, but then the economic implications, not just in the long term, but even while top of the system, that people who are incarcerated continue to have to feel and continue to have to uh, continue to have to, uh, to 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 submit to because of the structures that are in place. LB or Ames, um, and that 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 was a great um, response to that, Wes. But do you, as researchers, have anything you want to add to that that we should be thinking about? Yeah, um, I, I'd be happy to. I think Wes is exactly right that shrinking the number of people who interact with the system in, in any way has to be the uh, of, uh, of what we're going to do here. Um, there are a few other things we can do. I was reading an article the other day about someone who um, was in the medical field and in a relatively low wage position, uh, and they'd be able to uh, gain a significant promotion if they could clear a background check, which they can't do because of a criminal conviction when they are 17. That's absurd, uh, and it doesn't have to be that way. We can have policy tools that let people who have a criminal record um, move past it, uh, preferably sooner rather than later, but certainly you know, when it's that far in the past. Um, you know, these are the, the policy tools, we, we commonly call them sealing and expungement. It you know, seals a criminal record so that not everyone can see it, or expunges it so you can deny that it ever existed in the first place. Um, those are really important reforms. A lot of our peer organizations are working on it through, initi through an initiative called Clean Slate. I think that's that's really pivotal. Um, we we also need to think uh, about prison education. Like we we find in the that prisons are hugely damaging to people's um, well-being. We we know as well that they're traumatic places to be that have profound consequences that are not just economic. They don't have to be that way. Um, we can have prison education programs that give people um, a different experience behind bars. It'll, it'll obviously uh, it, it, it's a far cry from reducing incarceration altogether, but it's a step we can take. Um, that can start at the federal level with repealing the ban on Pell Grants that uh, uh, provide that people who are in prison uh, can't receive Pell Grants to support post-secondary education. Um, there's There have been a number of efforts to repeal that ban. Uh, I, I think it should pass sometime. Uh, I think that's hugely important. So Ames, that was a perfect segue into our next question, which I'm going to direct to LB, um, because you talk about things that the, the federal leadership can do. Uh, to address some of these issues. So I'll be, our question is, in recent years, there've been significant criminal justice reform efforts at the federal level. Uh, to what degree, if any, have those efforts addressed the economic disparities outlined in the report? And I'll be, you know, we all, you and I have worked shoulder to shoulder on these issues. We've been working very diligently to try and get leadership at the federal level to put real reforms in place that address some of these issues. Um, so how does the report help with that effort? Yes, and um, you know that's an excellent question. At the, the federal level, we need to make sure that sort of everyone understands um, there are a couple of different lever levers that the federal government has. Um, there are you know about 165, 170 thousand people in, in federal prisons uh, today, right? It's a small portion of 
who is incarcerated in America. So most of the people who are incarcerated are incarcerated at the state and local level. Um, but when we talk about the federal government, right, there's a lot that the federal government can do to improve conditions um, in the federal prisons. Um, additionally, the federal government has the lever of funding. And we at the Brennan Center, and Nicole, you've been a partner with us on this work for many years, have um, tried to advocate um, year after year for the federal government to um, use its federal funding, right, that lever, to send money to states to focus on decarceration. Um, a lot of the federal funding from the 1960s um, through today that the federal government has sent to states and, and local governments and police departments is to um, make more arrests, right? And, and that was that was really how the federal government um, thought that they could use their funding, their lever, their power to reduce crime in this country. Um, but we know that that was devastating. And we know that so much of that federal funding funded drug task forces, right? That we know a lot of the funding was tied to grant questions that asked police officers, how many arrests are you making? How many drugs are you seizing? And we've worked very hard with the federal government for many years to try to change those incentives. And so um, we are continuously advocating and we're gonna continue to do so to ask the federal government to use its grant making power to send money to states to decarcerate. Um, to send money to states to focus on how to reduce the impact of fees and fines. And these are some of our priorities at the Justice Program, at the Brennan Center, and something that we're going to continuously work for um, in the future. Thank you, LB. Um, my next question is one um, that I actually think could take up a whole panel discussion in and of itself. <laughs> Uh, and um, maybe that's maybe maybe that's fodder for for another panel discussion uh, suggestion later. Um, but it, it's this: um, Why don't Black and Latino people's wages recover over time the way white people's wages do? Does this have something to do with the way in which they experience the criminal justice system? So, Wes, I'm going to turn to you to to start uh, responding to that question that, again, I think could take up a whole nother hour <laughs> uh, of focused discussion. It, 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 it absolutely could. And the reality, it really comes down to one word, racism. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's not a racism that just exists within the criminal justice system. I mean, you, you, you look at the disparities, uh, you know, you look at the disparities that exist even without any form of connection with the criminal justice system in terms of wages. You know, right now, uh, among people who are socioeconomically similar, we spoke about this a little earlier, but a, a white person with a criminal conviction earns more on average than a black person who has never been convicted of a crime. That's a fact. And, and so there is there, when you look at the dynamics that exist here, uh, the reality is, is that racism is still steeped and seated in many of these systems that we talk about. And, and, and I, I think about it when people talk about racism like it's an individual act, like it's a thing, right? Well, this person does that, therefore it is racist. Or this person does that, therefore that's a racist act. I attend a white supremacist rally. I, uh, I use the N word, that's a racist act. Racism isn't an act, racism is a system. Racism is a system that allows these disparities to then take place. And so I feel like part of our posture when it comes to not just organizationally, but as a, as, as a, as a, as a lane, as a structure, as a society, this idea of taking on an anti-racist posture is just the difference between being an observer of the, of the inequities and actually working to do something about it. So that's how, I, when we look at these disparities, frankly, it, it's not terribly surprising and it's not terribly surprising, unfortunately, because it mirrors similar dynamics and similar statistics that we see even when the, even when connection with the justice system is not the variable that we're trying to dissect. Um, Wes, thank you for somehow <laughs> being able to synthesize an answer for us um, that starts to get at the, at the heart of that question. Um, I'm gonna take another question that talks about um, law more that gets more into law enforcement and the privatization of law enforcement and that question is what impact would you say the privatization of law enforcement and the prison system 
has had on mass incarceration and the increases in inequalities. Uh, and I'm going to turn to, to LBU and Ames for that question, because again, I know this has been a huge part of your work uh, at the Brennan Center, looking at that uh, intersectionality between policing and the privatization of law enforcement. So LB, why don't you start for us? Sure, so um, it, you know, it looks like the, the question gets at sort of, has the privatization of justice sort of perpetuated mass incarceration? And you know, we do a lot of thinking and talking and wrestling with that idea here at the Brennan Center. And what's really important to understand is that we would have had mass incarceration you know, with or without privatization, but privatization is inexorably intertwined with mass incarceration. And what I mean by that is that the system now is so big, right? We have a prison industrial complex that feeds off of privatization of, um, of, of prisons, of services, of um, you know, companies that provide um, electronic monitoring to the 4.5 million people on probation and parole, companies that provide electronic you know, email services, phone calls, and my worry about privatization moving forward is that if we're serious about decarceration, then we really want to significantly reduce and downsize our correctional footprint in this country. We can't continue to rely on the private sector for so many of these goods and services because we've truly built a prison industrial complex um, that is a significant hindrance to serious decarceration in this country. LB, thank you for that. And I, I want to open that up. Um, and I want to open it up to, to Wes and Ames to comment more, not just on that, but I think this also relates to the to the earlier question on on, on, on our expectations of, of, of the federal government and, and leadership. Um, you know, do where do we go for, for responses and answers? Do we go to the private to the private industry? Do we do we depend on our federal leadership? Wes, let, let me let me go to you first because um, I think there may be some nuances you want to add um, with respect to both of those questions. And, and then Ames, I'll turn to you. No, thank, thank you so much. And, and, and first, I you know I echo what LB said. And it, you know, while it's important that we have a focus on the federal side and things happen within the federal government when it comes to justice system. Uh, the reality is that we cannot just uh, mean that this can take state and local off the hook on this because so many of the reforms have to come from them. Uh, so many of the adjustments that need to take place need to come from them, not just because they represent the, the, the large proportion of those who are incarcerated, but also because many of the structural changes that need to take place, those are, nece those are not necessarily federal acts of federal bills that are being enacted. These are state and local policies. Uh, that need to be uprooted. So the state and local have to understand their responsibility. Uh, but also, you know, to this, to the other point about, you know, kind of the privatization, we have to be incredibly deliberate about this pushback of this hyper militarization of police forces. You know, how are we looking at the goals that we're assessing? How are we looking at the targets? And so when we have the targets and the goals that we will have for local police forces on things like how many tickets are being given, how many, how many arrests are being made, people will then move and adjust to be able to hit the targets and the metrics that are set out for them. So if that is a target, then a person is simply doing their job by being able to try to hit that target. We have to adjust how it is we're thinking about the benchmarks that we're setting for local law enforcement. We have to think about the benchmarks and the, and, and, and the tools that we're allocating and advocating for local and state law enforcement to be able to have access to because all of those things have a way of perpetuating the type of dynamic and the type of challenges that this report and that organizations like Brennan, like Robin Hood are consistently having to push back against. All of those things have to be incorporated when we're deciding and, and, uh, and thinking about this interface of state and local and also this interface of privatization versus the public good that we have when it comes to uh, maintaining a level of, of, of law and order. Thanks so much, Wes. Um, Ames, I'm sure you have some things you want to add to that before we close out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I just want to note uh, one, one important thing. Uh, a couple of years ago, we actually did see a major federal criminal justice reform uh, act passed called the First Step Act. I think there's been you know, some hope that this would be you know, the silver bullet that solves criminal justice in the United States. And there have been some people on the other side saying, hey, well, it does absolutely nothing. Uh, neither of those takes is true. Um, 
There are thousands of people who have been helped by the First Step Act. Thousands more every year will face shorter sentences because of it. Um, but on the flip side, we still have, um, I just pulled it up, 155,000 people uh, subject to federal jurisdiction in prison or um, facilities like it. So um, that federal reform is really important, but it's a drop in the bucket. Um, as Wes was saying, we really do need uh, local efforts to support that. Um, uh, and, and prosecutors certainly can, can play a part in that as well by you know, choosing who they prosecute for misdemeanors and offering options for avoiding conviction for people who are able to complete um, certain programming. We call those uh, diversion initiatives. Um, but yeah, there, there are a lot of solutions and it's definitely not just federal, but I do think the federal government has a part to play as LB was saying too. Thank you, Ames. And, and, and Wes, thank you all for adding to what LB had, had, has shared. It's clear from this conversation that um, there are a lot of work to be done. Um, this report clearly is foundational uh, to that work, um, but we, I know, urge everyone to continue having these critical conversations and to continue looking at ways that we can collectively work to reform these systems and work to create that equality that we've been talking about, that you talked about earlier, Wes, um, and create a level playing field for all people, regardless of income, race, or anything else you wanna use to fill in the blank. Um, that's what our focus has to be for those of us who support and believe in justice. Um, I wanna thank you all for this really incredible and enlightening uh, conversation today. Wes, thank you uh, for your work, for the work of the Robin Hood Foundation. It's critically important. Um, and I'm so grateful to you for the work that you do um, and equally grateful to the Brennan Center for putting out this report uh, and, and, and adding it to the conversations that we're all having around the country right now. Uh, you all did an amazing job as always. Your research is, uh, is, is, is always, is always a second to none. Um, uh, and, uh, I am grateful also to Terry. We are sorry that she couldn't be here with us. Today, but we know that her work has made such a difference to this report. Um, we are also very appreciative of the partnership that the Brennan Center has with the NY, NYU Bordemus Center and NYU Votes for collaborating on this program with us today. Um, and remember, as Michael Waldman said at the start of this conversation, we encourage all students to vote. It's the way in which you use your voice as part of our collective democracy to make a difference. Uh, and I'm Nicole Austin Hillary again, and I, it's been my pleasure uh, as a former Brennan Center colleague uh, and now as the executive director of the U.S. Program of Human Rights Watch, where we are working hand in hand with our partners at the Brennan Center and at other organizations to fight for human rights, civil rights and social justice, just like we talked about today. It's my pleasure to have been here with you today. Just a few more housekeeping notes before we let you go. Um, first of all, if you have not already done so, and we can't let you go as we are just less than two months out from uh, our national ele election. We can't let you go without reminding you. So please go and do two things. One, complete your census form online if you haven't already done so. You can go to my 2020 census, D-O-T-G-O-V. It's quick, it's efficient, and it's an easy way to make sure you're counted. I did it. You can do it too, it doesn't take long, and it makes such a huge difference in terms of what our communities get in terms of services and support. And you can do this despite the pandemic that we're facing. Um, it's very easy and it's something that we need to have happen. Um, so please tell everyone you know to make sure that they are counted in 2020. Secondly, if you can sign up to vote by mail or participate in early voting in your state, if your state doesn't offer these options to you, please, please um, reach out and, and ask them to make sure that these options are available to you and use your own personal bully pulpit and tell all of your friends and family to do the same. Now, if you can't vote by mail and participate and vote early in your state, again, reach out to those elections officials and tell them, I need these mechanisms at my disposal. Not only do I need them, my neighbors need them. This is how we all need to be able to engage during this pandemic moment because our votes matter. So call your local member of Congress, let them know that you want those options to help protect your vote. So again, thank you all for coming out today, for supporting this work and for supporting the work of the Brennan Center. Please go forward and continue to have these important conversations and please do what you can uh, to be engaged in helping to protect our country's democracy. Thank you all. Be well.